Hello and welcome to Promo Arts. Tonight we're streaming live from the gallery for a virtual artist talk and tour with Hope Forstenser for her exhibition, The Dream of Flight. I'm Janice Cotter, gallery manager. Before we start, I'd like to express gratitude to Como Arts Board of Directors and our uh, longtime supporters, the City of Port Moody, the Province of British Columbia for the Canada Summer, or pardon me, for the Community Gaming Program, the Government of Canada for the Canada Summer Jobs Program support, and uh, Peller Estates, as well as our 2021 gallery sponsor, Edgar Development. At this time, Homo Arts board, staff, and instructors have started doing the work to create an equity, diversity, and inclusion policy. We are working with facilitators, reading, and taking workshops that include anti-oppression, cultural safety, reconciliation, and land acknowledgements. We want to ensure that when we complete the process, we will have a better understanding of the history that has brought us to live in this place so that we are mindful of the ongoing legacies of colonialism and we are able to make a sincere and heartfelt land acknowledgement that will not be performative. Until that time, please know that the people at Homo Arts are working to make this a culturally safe space. Thank you for joining us this evening. Hope for Stancer is a relative new, or pardon me, a native New Yorker no, no, no. <laughs> who has worked extensively in film and theater and ceramics before falling madly and irrevocably in love with glass in 2000. By 2003, she had up and moved to Seattle to study glass with as many artists as she could find. She slowly developed a feel and a style of her own, finally becoming a teacher in 2008. She has been living in Vancouver since 2012 and is a proud member of Terminal City Glass Co-op, where she works and teaches. She has shown her sculptural work in juried shows at Diadamo Waltz Gallery in Seattle, you're welcome. Uh, Seymour Art Gallery in North Vancouver, Craft House Gallery in Vancouver, the Art Gallery of Burlington in Ontario, and as a part of a group commission for the Vancouver Opera. I am pleased to introduce Hope for Spencer for to tell you more about her exhibition. Come on in, Hope. Thanks. Hey everyone. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Hope Force Spencer, and this is uh, The Dream of Flight. Thanks for tuning in, um, uh, from wherever it is you're tuning in. I'm really glad that you're here. And I wanted to just start by talking a little bit about my own glass journey, just a brief little sort of synopsis. I started off sort of what I was doing in, in my own creative expression, initially as a photographer and a storyteller, I slowly um, began to make, slowly began to change the way I was uh, working with storytelling and photography. I started off doing that separately, then together in film, and then moving from there to multimedia theater, where I kind of got burned out pretty, pretty quickly, but that's a different story. But I went from there to graphic design and eventually found my way into glass. And it was by doing glass that I was able to make use of my graphic design skills, my photography skills, and my storytelling skills, or what I hope are those skills, to be able to create work that manages to incorporate all of the things I've done historically together in one place with glass. Um, in 2005, I was at Pilcher Glass School in Washington State. And while I was there, um, uh, there was also in residence at the time was an artist named Jeffrey Sarmiento, who was the first artist I ever saw put images on glass using a very particular method. And I copied that method, although uh, stylistically we're extremely different, he's much better than I am, but uh, I copied the method that he used in the film 
balance that you use with the kind of cattle that you use. And at the same time, uh, Walt Lieberman, another glass legend, was there. And Walt was also uh, really an innovator in putting the on glass. And I got really, really fascinated. And that, that journey developed over time and has brought me pretty much where I am right now. This is my third solo show. The first one um, was also made use of this, um, the same kind of approach, making use of the exact kind of photo translation work that Jefferson Manzo did by um, putting images onto glass balloons. And the second one has sort of expanded it a bit after taking a class with John Croucher and Luke Jacob, who, um, John Croucher being uh, the founder of Dapper Glass um, out of New Zealand, and learned how to make use of photosensitive glass as well. So I'm like a little bit of a mad scientist. I get really excited about processes. I get really excited about different ways of playing and pushing uh, images of glass together. So in this particular case, for this particular show, I got really into wings. Um, I got, it happened like a long time ago. These, these shows tend to develop on their, on their own time. But wings to me have always been such a central fascination for people. And um, I, I came to this particular show through Icarus, who I've always had a real particular fascination with because of the attempt to be a flying person and the price you pay for attempting to be a person with wings. And that kind of was the beginning of the sort of wing rabbit hole I had been falling down on and off for the past several years, actually. And I got really interested in the manner in which human beings mythologically and in religious icons and in terms of our own storytelling and the way we actually dream. I mean, the dream of flight being the name of the show is because that's what people dream about. They dream about flying. And we can't. And we're fascinated by things that can't. So um, I'm going to take you on a tour of the different kinds of uh, mythological creatures and religious icons and, and just straight up stories that attach, that we've attached as human beings to um, flying creatures of all sorts. So we're going to start over here. Um, this critter here to my left, uh, this is the phoenix the rising from the ashes. And this is a work that um, makes use of both blown glass and stained glass methods. It's a copper foiled stained glass piece with lead frame. And each of the pieces are blown glass from mills. And that's the technical aspect of it. But the meaning of it, obviously, is the rebirth that a phoenix represents. And the phoenix, historically, has shown up in a lot, a lot of different mythologies. Its main one that has survived that we concentrate on most is the Greek mythology of the rising of a bird that uh, burns up and then is reborn. And um, I'm always fascinated by the wings of the phoenix. I, I have them tattooed on my arm, as a matter of fact. And um, I, I, this was really the first piece for the show that I made. And I, 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 the phoenix to me is the most representational pair of wings that, that sort of came after Icarus for me because there's so much about breaking everything down and then immediately allowing it to be reborn and come back up. Over here, this uh, piece is called News of the World. And this is uh, Hugin and Munin, which are a pair of mythological ravens that sit on the shoulders of the god Odin. And yeah, we're gonna let Star zoom in on them a little bit. Thank you, Star, to get a good look at the carvings on them. Um, these are blown glass that use the exact same photo transfer um, process that Jefferson Sarmiento uses through an electrolyte camera and a special film by a company called Resist. And uh, these were sand carved. Um, so uh, they're particularly there to tell the story of the difference between Hoopin and Moonin, who have always been sort of associated with the two parts of the human psyche, the part that's your brain and the part that's your heart which are both part of really, I guess, your brain. But in this case, are about the thinking, the wisdom, the feelings, the emotions. And their job was to fly around the world every night, come back, sit on Odin's shoulders, and tell him everything that they'd seen. And they're credited mythologically 
with providing Odin with his omnipotence. So the idea is really that he couldn't fly, so he had flying creatures that worked for him. This um, piece right here is the Bluebird of Happiness. And um, the deal with the Bluebird of Happiness is that it's fictional in terms of its kind of your, our ability to actually get anywhere near it. It's an idea of a false type of happiness, the kind that we're supposedly constantly looking for, but actually don't have any access to because it's completely unrealistic. It's not that being happy is unrealistic, it's that our notion of what happiness is has a tendency to be unrealistic. And it's more about um, the sort of straight up idea that what we think of as happiness when we try to form happiness in our brains is not actually what happiness is. Happiness is much more complex and more nuanced and in many ways more beautiful than we're taught to believe that it is. And these are hot sculpted and again have very faint words um, uh, on the, uh, that are sand blasted onto them, the same, using that same process that I used for, um, for the Hoogan and Women pieces. And it, it's a quote from Mark Twain. It says, uh, only the mad are truly happy and not many of those. <coughs> this is a hot sculpted piece. Butterfly. Um, our fascination, human beings' fascination uh, with butterflies is pretty endless. They're so transformative. They start life as one thing, they disappear into a cocoon, they break down completely and become something else. They're a pure transformation um, in a way that, and it happens every day. It's like, unlike the phoenix that supposedly burns up and reemerges, butterflies are doing that. They're not a myth, <laughs> they're doing it all the time. And humans uh, love butterflies. We love them. We love what they represent. We love that there's something incredible about the very, the very types of butterflies that exist in the world and how beautiful they are, how they change as a, as a regular thing. They do this magnificent thing on a regular basis. This is based on a Lumorpho butterfly. And those tend to be quite large and very dramatic looking. And um, I've always found that butterflies have a bring with them sort of a feeling um, that is extremely particular. There's a childlike sort of joy that comes with them. And that made me want to have any part of what I'm doing. This piece is the Strix. It's called the Omen. It's a Strix, which is an, uh, an owl, it's a mythological owl from Roman mythology. That uh, The Strix was actually a revenge piece. Um, the gods, uh, the goddess Aphrodite was angry with a woman who had gone to spend her time with Artemis and created, in the way that mythology is just plain nuts, um, had her cursed her to fall in love with a bear. I don't know if that's crazy. How do we get to an owl from a bear? Only in Roman mythology. So she falls in love with this bear. She has kids with the bear. Great image. And the, the children she has with this bear are going to be these brutes, shocking. And Zeus is so angry that these brutes are running around. They're not quite human, they're not quite animals, they're not right. He gets angry and turns them into various other creatures. And the mother, their mother gets turned into um, this strix, this owl of the old woman. Again, yet another example of which there's tons in religious iconography and mythology where people who are simply in the wrong place at the wrong time and manage to piss on a god and pay pretty dearly. This piece is made by pulling individual uh, glass canes and then uh, fusing the canes together to make the pattern that you see. And I think owls too um, are, seem otherworldly, even among birds, and that's another reason why owls fascinate me. But I also created this creature with its wings totally open and I, I happen to really love uh, the way that the wings are so suggestive of something that's descending or, or bringing news, not necessarily good news. Okay, I'm told to stay and not come over here. All right, uh, this is a counter Um This is basically fear of the dark. Uh, the mind's not knowing really what to do um, about uh, bats in general, 
um, the Mayan god of night, death, and sacrifice. Kamazots is associated, is part of the reason why we have such strong association with bats in the darkness. And also, if you do any actual real research into Kamazots, you'll see that um, most of the representations of them look shockingly like Batman. So we all know where that came from. In this particular case, these are hot sculpted um, wings. And bats are flying things that don't look like other flying things. Like when we talk about things that fly, we picture feathers, we picture a certain amount of grace and elegance. And there's something really feral about a bat. The, its wings are like skin, not like feathers. They're not, um, they're not graceful in the way that birds are. They have something else happening that makes it very unusual. And I'm sure that it was this behavior that made the Mayans want to associate Kamazots as a bat god, or a god of the night and of darkness and of sacrifice. Um, and uh, that's, what, that's what this one is. What? You're doing a good stuff. Thank you. This is a griffin. Um, it's also a ziz, a simurg. It has a number of different names in different, um, different cultures over time. It's a protective, a protector. Um, and in the original mythology, it was uh, a lion's body and an eagle's head um, and a tat eagle's talons and a lion's tail. And it guarded money and stuff and uh, people and protected them. The griffin has, over time, um, and the ziz that goes with it, the simmer, which are all considered sort of precursors to the phoenix in terms of their mythological histories. But it's always been a symbol of protection. And this uses, again, a combination of stained glass techniques, uh, copper foil stained glass with a lead frame, and it makes use of the um, image transfer uh, um, process that Jeffrey Sarmiento uh, introduced me to all those years ago through Resist. Um, and these are blown pieces that are then carved and um, put together in stained glass. And what I love about these is that while the wings are large and they're sort of imposing, their their, their colors, to me anyway, make them feel more like they're there to help you and to protect you, um, as opposed to threaten or to um, frighten. So. And now we're around to the ghost bird. So the ghost bird was the one that I really took the most liberty with, to be honest with you, because a ghost bird, its existence, there's a comic, uh, a Japanese comic of a ghost bird. There's, um, there's a, sort of an idea of a ghost bird in some stories that have been told, but there is no real strong mythology associated with it. My personal attachment to it is through a novel by Jeff Vandermeer called Annihilation, in which a character uh, is referred to by her husband as a ghost bird. It's somebody who we can't really get a feed on, who's really very elusive. And she eventually takes that name for herself down the road in later parts of the same story. What this is is an example of um, use of photosensitive glass. This is a photo that was transferred on glass. Glass can be used like photo paper. And again, blown pieces that have uh, then been um, used in a, in a stained glass environment. And what I love about this piece, to me anyway, and what I think is successful about it, obviously my opinion, is that it has this feel of uh, being seen and not seen, being there and not there. And I, I, that was what I wanted from it. And when I look at it, that's, that's what I get. So it gives me a certain amount of, a, of a, a happiness to see that it does what I kind of wanted it. It, it also has this real beautiful color to it that is very particular. And that is in part from the way the photosensitive glass works. It has gold in it. And where it exposes, it turns this, the glass this beautiful um, purpley color. And sometimes if it's really powerfully exposed, you get almost like a burgundy. In some places, <coughs> sitting on top of color, and in other places, it's, it's not. So it's got this very particular look. Um, and that gives it this kind of very unusual energy. But yeah, it's a little bit less mythological and more the inside of Pope's brain, but so it goes. So 
Take a risk. Everybody knows the story of Icarus, more or less, but we'll give it a, a real quick once over. Um, Icarus and Daedalus, his father, were being held prisoner by King Minos in the labyrinth that King Minos had Daedalus go to secure the Minotaur. And um, over many, many years in this very tall tower, they pulled, uh, Daedalus pulled the, the feathers of or took the fallen feathers and probably pulled some feathers of all of the different birds that made their way towards or near their prison in the tower. And he gathered the different kinds of feathers together, glued them together with candle wax, and uh, made wings for him and for his son. And when he told Icarus, uh, as Icarus was getting ready to fly away, he said, don't fly too high. The heat of the sun will not the wax, and um, you'll fall. And the story says that Icarus became so enamored of the ability to fly that he flew up towards the, towards the sun. Which, of course, if you know anything about how the atmosphere works, it makes absolutely no sense. The further up you go, the colder it gets. But let's for a second assume that he was so thrilled at the idea of being in the air, of doing something no human being has done before since, that he over, overplayed his hand and the wings, which were not really meant to carry him like a bird, but just get him to safety. Again, it's all part. And when I started thinking about this piece, I originally wanted the wings to be really, really elegant. And then I realized that the wings in the story are handmade, and they're not meant to stay together. And so I tried to make them a little less elegant, but I think they came out a lot more or less elegant. <laughs> but I've been fascinated by Icarus forever. I'm constantly fascinated by the idea. I think I got stuck on what it was that might have been going through his head while he was falling, nothing good, I'm sure, but what he thought of it. Who knows? So the dragonfly, that's what this is. This is again hot sculpted glass. Um, dragonflies have a really unusual position in the world as well, similarly to butterflies. They start off in the water and they end up in the sky. They don't ever actually go where we go. Um, that makes them, I think, pretty unusual. They can land on land, but only briefly. And the thing with dragonflies is they're enormous. <laughs> they're a huge bug. And for whatever reason, and it has to be these wings, they don't scare people. Right? I mean, if you stop thinking about it, most very large bugs freak people out. Dragonflies just don't. And they're like this long. And their wingspan is like this big. And it's these wings, these incredible wings that come in so many different colors and spread out in this sort of almost a clover shape out of its body that just, for some reason, doesn't make people nervous. Instead, it makes people want to protect it and also feel protected by it. Uh, most Dragonflies are symbols of good luck in a million different cultures. And they're also considered to be a source of great childish fascination. Again, very much like a butterfly. And I think that, you know, dragonflies are special in literally uh, every possible way. And I'm, I feel like this was a late addition to the show. I kind of brought the dragonfly in about six months ago because I really felt like, for me personally, I've always had a really strong attachment to dragonflies, so that was why I brought them in. Yeah. Thank you. This, this is a, a seraph or an archangel. And this was actually another part of dealing with glass that was new to me because I was learning how to manage fusing as part of getting ready to do this show. And <clears throat> this was definitely the most ambitious fusing I did. Um, and I thank Terminal City Glass for putting up with me while I was trying to, <laughs> I made mistakes along the road to trying to get this thing um, finished. But when we talk about angels a lot of the time, we picture them in flight, but really they spend most of their time waiting. Um, standing supposedly near to where God supposedly sits on a throne. 
and waiting to be given opportunities to show their adoration and to conceivably run errands, bring messages, do whatever it is that um, God's will and wants them to do. And so the, in these case, in this case of the angels, I've got the wings closed and the tail open because I always picture an angel waiting more than I picture them doing. And in many ways, um, that's how I've always imagined them. I never imagined them as flying. I imagined them as waiting. Well, what's interesting, too, is that we picture them as human beings with wings, like all of the mythology that we've associated with Old Testament and New Testament angels, is they look like people with wings, but we don't have any description of them at all. We don't, we don't know what those colors look like. We just know that they could fly. And some of them had as many as six sets of wings, one to cover their feet, one to cover their eyes, and one to actually fly with so that they would never look directly at God. Fascinating stuff. Finally, uh, this is Bedu. Uh, Bedu is the Egyptian uh, harem god, and these are harem names. And um, these are made by uh, using blown glass and then sand carved using the photoresist um, process as well. And uh, the Bedu may or may not have been the precursor to the Phoenix. The Simurg and the Ziz may have been the precursor to the Phoenix. The Phoenix and the Simurg and the and uh, Bennu and the Griffin, they're all connected to one another in a set of stories human beings tell. And the deal with Bennu in Egyptian um, mythology is that Bennu is a self-created creature, which means no one made it. Bennu made itself from the stuff of the universe, birthed its own self from stardust, and may or may not die and be reborn every few hundred years. Um, they uh, were from the city of Heli Heliopolis, where the god Helios was worshipped, so Ben was directly related to the sun god, and um, is, widely, had, is widely lost. Lots of uh, evidence of Ben in hieroglyphs, but not a whole lot in the modern telling of Egyptian mythology. So uh, I found a pattern on Ben's wings in the hieroglyphs, which I've, lit I've lifted directly for this to be just gorgeous, like the pattern itself really spoke to me. And the idea of a heron with this pattern on the wings, I thought would be really amazing, which is why I really wanted, wanted to make it. Um, and I think that ends our tour. I want to, before we go anywhere else, <laughs> to take questions, which I'm looking forward to. I'm super grateful that for those of you who have stuck around while I did all this chatting, um, I just want to say thank you to Lex Ireton for her endless, um, amazing assistance. Also to Scott McDougall and Guy Hollington for their continued help at other times in making the pieces. Cheryl Hamilton at I Creative for doing such a beautiful job making the armatures uh, and the stands and the hanging things. And to John Wilson Blackwell in general. Um, and my family, who is endlessly patient and hopefully watching right now. Probably should be getting ready for bed, but hopefully they're watching. So, okay. Whew. Thank you, Boo. Hold on, I get my water. That was a lot of talking, even for me. Okay. <laughs> um, you can tell we're a, a working art center with the music mm. coming from above. I really like it. Class yeah. people talking coming out of their classes. So sorry for any uh, interruptions on that. Um, I do have some questions here. Okay. Um, Rose Cap says, you seem to enjoy the experimentation of the different techniques. Yeah. Which is your favorite? Ooh. Um, that's hard, because on the one hand, I have this incredible sense of relief that I finally got the photosensitive glass to work. I've only been trying to do that for like, I don't know, six years or something. It's very hard. Thank you, Mr. Um, I think... The hot sculpting is actually my favorite, um, which would be the kind of work that I did on Icarus and on the bluebird and the, um, and the, the bat and the dragonfly and the, and the butterfly. I feel very much like uh, playing with the glass, heating it up, cutting it, shaping it, moving it. I have a long way to go to be really adept at that, and so right now that's got the most of my attention. 
Okay. Well, Rose has a second question that was part of that that says, what would you like to explore next? Whew. Uh, my next project is going to lean into sculpting and fusing quite a bit. Um, I'm right now trying to figure out exactly what that's going to look like, but it's going to include um, panels as well as sculpted pieces. So I'm going to be playing quite a bit with the fusing type of approach I did with the serif and the owl, as well as the hot sculpting that I've done with the other pieces. Okay. Uh, Jessica Pepin says, each piece is so different and visually intriguing. Do you strive to make, make each piece completely unique? Hi, Jess. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, the quick answer to that is yes. When I, when I, especially when I'm thinking about pieces in a group, the way that I was sort of putting these together to be shown together, it's important to me when I'm working on them that they not look too much like each other, or that they not resemble each other in such a way that makes me feel like I'm doing the same thing over and over, and that a person walking through it would be like, okay, here's another version of that, here's another version of that. Um, some of that is insecurity, I think. Like, I feel like I have to do my my top hat dance routine, like, da 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 I like to keep me interested. But, I, I mean, but I'm also just trying to make what I'm making interesting to me, who has a naturally sort of short attention span, and also to people who I imagine walking through and looking. Uh, our next comments come from Pi Math, and Pi says these are amazing. Okay. You've yeah. done it again, Hope. You <laughs> always challenge my ideas of what glass blowing can achieve. You'll have to go have a peek at the comments. Oh, thank you, Pam. That's lovely. And Jenny Judge says an incredible body of work of artwork, Hope. I like the way the stories guide your work and inspiration. How do you decide which techniques you're going to use? That's a good question. And hi, Jenny. Um, and I love your work as well, by the way. Everybody should check out Jenny Judge if you haven't already. Um, I think what happens is I, I think I tend to be very word forward. This is something I was in this, I had this great conversation with Tom Cossey at the Craft Council a couple of months back on their um, Instagram Live interview, where I talk about always sort of telling a story in my brain, starting with the words of the story and then coming up with what that story is gonna look like when I try and render it in glass. And what tends to sort of guide me when I'm figuring that out is um, what I think will tell the story best. And so I get a picture in my head of how to tell the story and then the pieces change as I work on them. As Janice could can very easily attest, I sent her all these sketches I had done in Illustrator because I don't draw my sketches, I do an illustrator because graphic designer. But um, they don't look the way that the sketches imagined they would in many ways. The phoenix changed really quite radically when I was building it. It became much more feathery than it was originally going to be. And I think what dictates it, I start with an idea of what I feel would be the best approach, and then I sort of let it, let the process take me to a certain degree, and also my own ability or inability takes me to a lot of where I go. I like to say throughout the whole time I was working on this show that I operate by failure. Everything is broken at least once. And I feel like that was partly because I was asking the glass to do something I didn't want to do, so I had to change tacks. Otherwise, I had to sort of assemble things and just be like, okay, this is as good as it's gonna be assembled because that's all I, I can do, or this is as good as the sculpture is gonna look. And sometimes I changed the way pieces were made and I, I want to make sure that while I'm thinking about it, I get an initial idea, but I don't want to stay married to it because that can be kind of dangerous. Um, Natalie, whoops, Natalie asked, what was the most challenging part about putting together this body of work, which leads to the point that you were making about each piece was broken at least once? At least once. Um, yeah, the most challenging thing about it is the feeling that, I think this is the most challenging thing about glass, honestly, is it's so finicky and fragile. And when you're asking it to do things that may push it outside of its comfort zone, all sorts of things can happen. And that is always the biggest challenge. It's like the, the glass resists doing certain things. Um, 
all the time. And it resists when you're asking it to do things you normally would do. When you're asking it to do even weirder stuff, it gets even more resistant. And I've gotten a lot of learning, steep learning curve on how to handle hot spill through glass and how to handle uh, using stained glass techniques on blown glass. That's kind of just, just having an immersive course on that. Sorry. Yeah, no, Jenna's <laughs> laughing. She knows how bad it's been. I'm like, there's a crack again. I have to take it apart for each other again. Yeah, that's happened a bunch. Uh, Eva Moore says, Marcus wants to know what is your favorite color of glass to use? Oh, okay. Well, for those of you who don't know, Eva Moore is my wife and Marcus is my five-year-old son. <laughs> so Marcus wants to know what my favorite color of glass to use. And Marcus, the answer to that, I think, is this red. Strawberry red. <laughs> Strawberry red. Yep. Oh. Right in black one, three now. Okay. <laughs> um, Jimmy Wang says, um, amazing collection, Hope. I noticed that the wings are disembodied. Mm. What is the significance of excluding the body and just focusing on the wing parts? That's a really good question. I love that question. And the answer to that is um, to be able to imagine them on you. That has always that was always my thinking with this show was I thought about creating whole birds or a whole you know dragonflies or a man with wings for Icarus. And then I, I realized that to me the heart of the show in my head anyway, and who knows if that worked out well or translated well, was the idea that we want wings so bad and we can't have them. And so when you come in here when there isn't a body attached to the wings, maybe you can put your body with the wings if you want to be your own angel. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and and uh, Jimmy also says thank you for the wonderful tour. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for watching. Andrew Arnes Arneson? Mm -hmm. Arenson? Arenson. Okay. Absolutely Aronson. gorgeous. Aronson? Aronson. Okay. My apologies for this. It's pronouncing your name, sure, Andrew. Sure. Um, absolutely gorgeous. I love how it works. I love the overall theme and how the various pieces embody each flyer. Bravo. Thank you. And Lovely. Juliet Forstenser um, Espinosa. Espinosa. I just can't see it. That's I'm okay. Sure. I can fill it in. That's my oh, sister. Oh, great. That's my sister. <laughs> Um, and uh, Juliet says, the combination of mythological and real creature wings is compelling. Like you are building a bridge between the real and imagined worlds. So beautiful. Oh, that's lovely. And that actually, what I love about that too, is that it goes back to me answering Jimmy's question about why there are no bodies with wings. It's like, you can imagine them mythological wings or real wings. We can try and picture ourselves in them. Yeah. yeah. That's a that bridge is that guy too. Yeah. And Andrew has um, asked which wings lift your spirits the most? The Phoenix lifts my spirit the most, actually. Um, I think to me, there's something about the way they came together and about what they represent. And like I said before, I, I can't pull this up right now to show you, but I do have a, a, a Phoenix tattooed on my arm. <laughs> so um, I have a lot of. A real uh, that that piece was one of the first pieces I, I completely finished and it has from the beginning put the biggest smile on my face. I think that was one of the questions as well was which was the piece you were most connected to. Yeah, it's definitely that Phoenix. Um, Susan Rabinovich mm -hmm. um, says incredible exhibit, intellectually stimulating and a visual feast. Thank you. Thank Would you. love to get in there to see it in person. Are you here? If you are, you should come. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, let's see if there are more questions. Mm -hmm. Don Moore says, I love it. Each piece is so lovely. Each piece an engaging story. Thank you for all the work you put into this exhibition. It really paid off. I wish I could see it. 
Sorry, I had to extend okay. it. I wish I could see it in person. Unfortunately, my computer froze at the dragon. <laughs> oh, no, Don. Maybe because it loved it so much. <laughs> it would not let go. That's a great. great That's my father-in-law. Oh. Love it. <laughs> and um, some of them, uh, the comments, I'll just let you go in based on how you look. look. Just yeah, looking great. for. Uh, more questions, sure. Um, and uh, Sar Baines does say every piece of art is just simply beautiful. Thanks for this virtual dream of flight um, art tour. It's very fun. So, um, and I have some other questions yeah. here. Go for it. And uh, um, it, one of them was, um, and, and I'm not sure if this was covered because I didn't hear all of. I only heard some of the talk. Yeah. Um, do you recall the moment that sparked this series, and how long has it been in the works? Huh. Because you contacted me I did. quite a long I time did. ago before um, you started. I do remember, actually. I was working on a show I was doing at the Craft Council Gallery, a show called Inside Out, that uh, was at that gallery in the late fall of 2017. And I had a piece that I was planning on putting in that show. And it was called, actually, The Dream of Falling. And it was Icarus tumbling out of the sky. And um, I had trouble designing it in a way that I liked. Like, every time I sketched it, every time I thought about it, I didn't, I found that it wasn't working for me. And I sort of scrapped it from the show and replaced it with something else. But then the idea kept popping into my head of, I had been putting Icarus wings, I had been putting wings on things. I had wings on my back. I have tattoos with wings on my back also. Some tattoos. Shh, what are my parents? Um, but uh, I have wings on my back, and with those wings I had put on some vases a long time ago. And I started to really think about this idea of the picture of those vases with just the wings on them and then the falling Icarus. I started being like, what if what if we just thought about all the way that we all the ways that wings call us? And then I just got this idea to do that. And I actually talked about doing it at the artist talk for that show. And it took a long time. A lot of stuff happened right after that. There was about a year where I couldn't make anything. Uh, my mom died, my leg broke, there was all kinds of stuff going on. And then that really sort of halted me for quite a bit. And when I came back into things, I, it was just slower. And so by the time I really got the whole idea together, you know, it was 2019 or early 20, it was, it was 2019, that's when I showed it to you. And that was after Terminal City Glass had done the show yeah. here, and Terminal you were part of that show right. as well. Right, had a Terminal City Group show here, a really great show. Oh, yeah. that, that was, it was a really fun show. Yeah. You had quite a few pieces in that I show. I did, I had three pieces in that, that was great. Yeah. Um, Eva says, um, Dad, my screen has a start. Oh, I she's talking to her dad. To her dad. My, my wife and her father, father are trying to solve this. There was problem. a question. There was a, I saw a question mark at the end, so it just started reading. <laughs> Apologies, Eva. Oh, no, I love that. My favorite. <laughs> um, I will go back to um, the other question I sure. had here. And uh, if, if you haven't answered it already, mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us about your personal relationship to these mythologies you've depicted yeah. and why you chose to do a show dedicated towards them? So this is the second time that I've taken on mythology like whole hog in a show. My first show was called Stories for Children. And it was, uh, I filled a whole gallery with blown glass balloons. There were, um, I think, 42 of them, I think. Yeah, 42 of them. And, each one of them were in groups. Uh, the balloons were lit from inside and, and hung from the ceiling and had villains and monsters from children's stories all over them. And I researched all of the monsters to both find them and put them on the balloons. And I ended up creating a little book, uh, an actual physical book that went with the show that talked about all of the stories and monsters. And I had a real love of the human uh, need to create mythology for a really, really long time. I wrote a play back in my play days that leaned heavily on fairy tales and on the history of fairy tales. And then when I went to start researching 
the, the balloons. I was like, okay, I'm gonna get monsters. I'm going into Grimm's fairy tales. And I'm gonna look through the Grimm's fairy tales and I'm gonna get monsters out of Grimm's fairy tales. And there are no monsters in Grimm's fairy tales. All of the monsters are people. There are no monsters. And that also floored me. I was just like, I, I have such a vivid memory of being so frightened by those stories. And what, and that just kind of pushed, that research pushed me even further into it. And also, and I said this, I think, in the conversation I had with Tom from the Craft Council, is I think I hide behind it a little. I think I have such a, a such a comfort level and such a confidence in my ability to tell a story or to relate to a story or to get involved in a story as a reader, as a writer, as a talker, whatever. And I have a lot less confidence in my skill with glass. And so I feel like if I can get behind a story with it, I can use, I can go word forward, like I said, which is like very much this idea that I'm telling the story and I'm showing the story. And at some point I'll get enough guts to just go crazy abstract <laughs> and just rely on the glass itself, which I think you should do. Well. I remember the uh, bedtime stories one. Yeah. Um, because we had one yeah, of the things yeah. um, in, in our show and it was amazing. Yeah. And it was quite fun to install. <laughs> yeah. I remember drilling holes in the ceiling of the CMR gallery. Yeah. 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 Oh, I think I might have conversation. Sure. Oh, Curran Wharf mm -hmm. says, wonderful, such an incredible demonstration of your intellectual curiosity, extraordinary skills, and deep sense of beauty. Would love to be Thank there you, with Curran. you. Lovely. And um, now I'm not sure if this has a, a question, but I'm going to read it. This comment is from, oh, it's, it's, Zunvo? Okay, Zunvo. Oh, okay. Zoom. Oh, my apologies. Sorry, right. Zoom. I, I'm trying to read. That's okay. That's fine. He don't always he understand. understand. But yeah. it says this. He grew up in North Carolina. He's had oh. that drama so much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, the, he says this comment is from Lai. Lee. Lee. Mm -hmm. Love the colors. Love the stories behind each piece. Interesting to hear you talk about our human obsession with flight. And then, sorry, uh, um, and then make the wings out of glass. Is there any psychology there for you hmm. about flight and glass? Interesting. Okay, so here's what I can say about that. Glass can't fly. Breaks so easily. And my own personal psychology with it, I think, has always been that I don't dream about flying. And I've always wondered why I didn't in so many people. Um, I've had a lot of other weird iconic dreams, like the one where you scream and no voice comes out, or the one where your teeth fall out, or all those other iconic, I can, but I can grab dreams, iconic dreams, thank you, my mouth has stopped working. Um, but I've never, until two days ago, actually, I had a dream I was flying. And I told my family about it so much that my kids were like, yeah, 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 we're flying, you told us, we're in um, But I feel like I've always had a certain fascination with um, with what it would feel like to have the ability to fly. And I don't mean like Superman fly, I mean like angel or bird fly. I never thought about superhero flying, I just thought about birds, about wings, about carrying that power on your back. Um, Eva says that, Marcus says he likes the colors. Thank you, I like them too much. Well, there's loads of comments on Facebook okay. that you should check out and I'm see. Sure we had a great attendance. Oh, how lovely. And um, how lovely. thank you so much for um, being here and being in our gallery space. Thank you for having me. And thank you all so much for sticking around and listening and uh, taking this tour with me. I'm sorry we can't have the things we used to have before COVID where we could have a room full of people all talking at once, but it's lovely to know that you all are out there watching it, so thank you so much. Uh, we will be back next week with our uh, first
heard another virtual artist talk with, for Water Speaks, which is a, a youth-led um, story program through waterlution.org, and they've been paired with visual artists from across Canada. Mm -hmm. We'll have the artistic director, uh, Christopher McLeod, um, Elena Timber, one of the program um, coordinators, and Jay Havens, one of the visual artists, as well as uh, possibly one of the youth storytellers. So it we'll, remains to be seen how many guests we'll have. I hope you'll be able to join us again next Thursday evening at 7.15 uh, as we stream live on Facebook. So uh, good night, and uh, we'll see you again next week. Thank you for coming. <laughs>